Well, welcome back, everyone. So the final session today, we're going to start off talking about the continents, and then we're going to move to the oceans. And it's dominated by uh, discussions and descriptions of active deformation, which plays an important role in all this. So the first talk is a keynote talk given by Cindy Ebinger, and she's going to talk about rifting and the Wilson cycle. Well, it's my uh, great pleasure to have been invited to give a talk here. And I, I was at a, I think many were at a, at a loss to decide how to organize the talk. Um, I, I just wanted to touch on some folks or it, throughout the talk, um, bring up a few people who aren't here, but whose names really should be mentioned and who were inspirational to me and who motivated a lot of science. And I guess what I also want to say as I start is that uh, the act of deformation is really a true test to plate tectonics as well, is because what we observe in the short term needs to average in some way to the longer term or produce the topography, produce the gravity anomalies, produce the, um, the plate tectonics at uh, that, that we are, are looking at over these time average scales as well. And so looking to see where the mismatches are and understanding how, what component of those are related to plate rheology, this really tough nut that we, we still are working on and trying to crack um, that involves the entire community, um, both in understanding plate rheology and also the elusive asthenosphere. So, um, and obviously from this talk, um, I'm trying to keep with the theme of the time um, and I'm quite sure that this group of individuals over here was looking at those sketches and plate kinematic diagrams and learning this new language, although they might have wondered what was different from that and Manson and stuff. No, sorry. No, that, that, not funny. Um, uh, okay. But I did not, I decided not to come in costume as well. Um, but to just put aside any comment about what I was doing or my role in the plate tectonics revolution, it was nil, <laughs> okay? And about all I was doing was trying to be sure that one of my siblings wasn't eating my, my ice cream while I had my back turned. So, yeah, um, okay, oh no, oh no. I don't know what's happened. So, so I, I cropped, and I think we may have some problems, because this was a crop, and it looked fine on my screen. Underneath here <laughs> <laughs> is the Wilson cycle. And so you'll have to trust me to explain to you about J. Tuso Wilson's plate tectonic, the, the Wilson cycle, or what we refer to as the Wilson cycle. And there, are, there is no diagram in the classic paper in fact, what it is is a list, and it's ocean birth, and that's East Africa example, and typical rocks of that time period. And then um, ocean birth, and then maturity, formation of a basin, and then eventual closure of the basin system, uh, subduction, collision, and then reinitiation of the process. And in thinking about this, he based this concept on studying the um, Eastern North America, where we had the Iapetus margin and stretching, and then uh, separation, creation of a basin, and then collision, and then in Mesozoic time, the initiation of rifting again in the eastern side of the Appalachian Mountain system. But you know, you think it, to digest that much information and to place it in the context of plate tectonics and to devise this cycle that, of course, isn't here, um, is was remarkable to me, it remains remarkable. But I, what I thought I'd do is highlight where we've gone from that and, and how the Wilson cycle is a cycle, but what other additional process we've learned about, what new discoveries we made, and even though, I mean, one could argue the early plate tectonics folks find this great theory, and there's some lots of low-hanging fruit, and now we're reaching for higher pieces of this, um, we're also now, and I'm going to try and emphasize in my talk today, we learned so much from the oceans, but we've now turned back to the continents and we're learning a great deal that we can uh, take back to understand parts of the ocean and ocean dynamism and understanding dynamic topography in the ocean floor as well. Okay, so one of the things that wasn't in the Wilson cycle is mantle plumes. Now, this is one version of mantle tomography models interpreting a large number of 
low velocity zones that may or may not uh, are associated then with volcanism magmatism at the surface. Um, some uh, low velocity zones associ not associated with any hotspot. This is from French, from uh, Romanowitz et al. And, uh, but there are, you know, there are many who have commented on mantle plumes, and that wasn't a feature in the Wilson cycle, yet it's an important part. And mantle dynamics is going to come back then as a, and mental dynamics and hydration state and fluids are going to be a part that I want to emphasize as well. Um, so my objective really is to, to look at what controls strain localization. And strain localization need not be the development of a myelinite zone. In this case, it's more where we are seeing either very slow or evidence from uh, space-based measurements looking back down on Earth and seeing very slow movements through GPS or INSAR, um, but also then looking at um, you know, the development of fault systems as well within continental interiors. And I'm going to add in some new insights on from mantle plumes and how they may uh, introduce <coughs> fluids or there may have been fluids retained from prior subduction. Um, so that they, the hydration state of the mantle and the crust are important, play coupling to the dynamic mantle, and the role, the, the dynamism of the, ma the mantle, its heterogeneity in the uppermost mantle, at least, the, lith the asthenosphere. Um, and then uh, you know, even come back then again and close with the Wilson cycle. So this is something that I put together that has a load of information on it, and I just want to point out a few I mean, this is kind of a community um, a synthesis in talking about it, NSF-based program, geoprisms, but we were um, just trying to include a lot of different processes in one diagram and how we take intact continental lithosphere and start to pull it apart. Well, it's compositionally layered and it's rheologically layered, and so different layers are going to respond in different ways um, to, the, to any applied stress. And, as we start to change the plate structure, we change its density, its composition, and we may, um, we have, with adiabatic upwelling, we have, sorry, we may generate melt through adiabatic upwelling in these zones of, of thinning, and that upwelling may then release volatiles that are, and magmas that are trapped or stored at different levels within the plate or rise to the surface as well. And how that plate responds in different layers, so B, this would be like a depth section through the plate where we might expect to see uh, deformation um, after an earthquake or during an earthquake uh, in this area and then driving post seismic slip and then creeping in lower parts of the plate. Um, and then we have time scales of deformation and that will vary. So different processes have different uh, time scales. And adding then magma to the system then, and adding fluids can change uh, the rheology of the plate in important ways as well. Okay. Um, one final thing uh, that obviously wasn't in the Wilson cycle, but through imaging and many other studies, we realized that Archean lithosphere was created differently. It's compositionally buoyant, uh, and it's uh, um, remained intact or thicker than, nor than different lithosphere or younger lithosphere, sorry. The, ma the magmas that were extracted were extracted at higher temperature and we have uh, a compositional difference between the Archean and, and later lithosphere. That it persisted there is a really strong constraint then in telling us about the interactions between the plates, the base of the plates, and the mantle, and the upper mantle. And these are just a series of models where uh, Claire Curry and Yolanta von Weick tried to pre uh, enable the edge of a craton to persist over periods of time. And the only way that they could do that is uh, to have um, a dry craton. If it were hydrated or if you had hydrated phases within, then it would be susceptible to advection and you'd move quickly inward and lose this deeper root to the lithosphere as well. And so the persistence of these cratonic edges then pro, um, provides some important constraints. And I, it also you know, explains why, to a large part, tectonism avoids the, craton, the cratons themselves. And so many cycles then um, develop on the edges of these cratons and these edges um, may then be advected laterally slowly through progressive rifting or, or other tectonic cycles. Um, okay, so I don't have time to whip through or I don't want to overwhelm everyone with loads of data. There's, there's lots of information in the literature. We know that we have two different types of, of uh, rift zones. We have extensional systems that develop in collapsing orogenic belts. 
And in those areas, the, the crust and the mantle is hotter. We've stacked up layers, we've eroded from the top, and we have um, a hotter geotherm than we would in, say, a craton. And the styles of rifting are quite different with broad zones of distributed strain um, and localized deformation to basin, say in the basin range is one example, but there are many areas uh, throughout the world. <coughs> and then the, orig um, the cratonic rifts, uh, with the active example, like he, the archetypal one is East Africa, may or may not have magmatism. And the differences in a way are, are confirming the importance of rheology. So the thermal state, obviously, <laughs> composition is important, strain rates are po probably less important than that as well. And, uh, the the um, fault lengths, many in this room, James Jackson and others, have looked at the uh, seismogenic layer thickness and compared with maximum fault length in extensional basin systems. I looked at effective elastic thickness or other measures of uh, plate rheology, and, and engineers have known for a very long time that the length of fault systems and their displacements scale is the strength of the plate. So plate strength is very important during the early stages of rifting, but is as uh, we get to see floor spreading, the generation of magma, and its rise to the surface is quite is the controlling factor. Um, I, I wanted to put a very quick um, slide in here just to point out that we're making progress to crustal rheology. There are many experimental studies and even new um, uh, in situ studies that are helping understand the um, strength profiles of hydrated or dehydrated quartz, feldspar, pyroxene, a range of crustal materials that are helping really build a picture. And Whitney Bear, a brilliant young scientist um, from the US is, and with, working with John Platt, has uh, come up with a, a very nice profile that is well fit by uh, Greg Hurst's laboratory models for a hydrated quartz. Um, this is just yield stress, coulomb stress, assuming a hydration factor or poor fluid uh, pressure and these are you know, well fit here. I also wanted to point out that many of the ways that we look at, at the crust and mantle is from seismology, and VPVS is, you know, whether we have a high VPVS ratio may or may not be indicative of fluids because there are metamorphic reactions occurring at different depths depending on the geothermal gradient. And this is just showing how at a depth maybe of about 25 kilometers in higher geothermal gradients, we have plagioclase that breaks down, and then the clinopyroxene in the rock increases, and we could have a fairly drastic change in the VPVS. And so large, um, I, there are many groups that are working on these problems and trying to help understand under what conditions and how, uh, you know, using a range of different seismic methods and MT methods, how to detect fluids and some of these metamorphic reactions as well. Okay, so all I wanted, I wanted, obviously, I'm going to talk a bit about East Africa and give some examples. I have spent a long time. Um, yeah, first time I went was when I was 20. Um, and so I've worked in, in a large part of the rift and had a ch the opportunity to um, compare and contrast in many different areas. And anyway, there, as we get more information, we know that most of the rift south of Ethiopia, so down through here, developed in the last 20 million years. The Western Rift is older than we used to think. We have new information saying that there was definitely magmatism by 18 million years ago, and probably 25, but roughly the same as the Eastern Rift. Lots of magmatism, and its role then is what I'm going to emphasize here. So every textbook, everything that we teach to students shows continental rupture achieving through tilted fault blocks and large offset fault systems. And we see large offset fault systems and lower crustal seismicity in basins without magmatism and very early stage. Um, by the way, these are receiver function estimates of crustal thickness. There's VPVS associated with them, and these are earthquakes. This is a typical half robin basin in southern Tanganyika down and through here. Um, and just giving a feel then for the styles of rifting during the early stages that then would become their stretch passive margins that um, Pindell was showing in a previous talk. Um, one of the things that's happening underneath the plate, though, in East Africa, this is a study uh, Mike Kendall, uh, a student, our colleagues and collaborators worked on, um, looking at the tra mantle transition zone beneath East Africa. And in many areas, and I won't talk about details, but these are um, receiver functions uh, stacked at the 410 and 670 discontinuities, and the changes in the pulse shapes and consistent changes throughout, you know, with velocity variations underneath. 
um, are indicative of fluids. And so the presence of high, uh, uh, aqueous fluids, most likely, and some melt uh, coming through the mantle transition zone. And that's consistently what the two chemists have been saying throughout East Africa. Every mantle xenolith is heavily metasomatized or hydrated phases. And we're bringing up, we're hydrating the mantle part of the lithosphere in this process. We also have widespread deformation. So this is mantle velocity models. This is hot off the press from Stuart Fishwick. Uh, lithospheric thickness then um, as estimates from his latest surface wave models. Um, the stuff we removed here, um, a lot of the mantle lithosphere has been drastically thinned and quite hot throughout a lot of the, uh, the region. We have a thick crit, um, crat, cartonic root that's being eroded inward from this side. The western rift lies here and thick, relatively thick cratons throughout this area where rifting's initiated uh, with some magmatism in here and up through in here and lot, uh, large volumes of magmatism here. I'm going to jump right into here in a second, but I quickly want to move over here. This is just a simple summed up uh, seismic energy release with the darker colors roughly magnitude six or more. Bin, uh, bins up over the time period of the NEIC catalog, 1973 to about to present, um, and just showing how the strain local is some plate-like behavior in some areas. This is the Davy Ridge and through here on line of active volcanoes coming across into Madagascar, but you know, some distributed strain in through here. Another plate-like zone in here, the Ravumo plate, perhaps, or a microplate. But then into the Congo Craton and through here, a deeply rooted craton that you can see through here. We have um, zones of seismicity, active faulting, active faulting in through here all the way down into the Okavango Rift system. So widely distributed strain, and, and Richard Gordon's probably laughing and saying, yeah, I said that in my 1985 paper that uh, um, um, marine magnetic anomalies required internal deformation across a broad zone, not just localized <coughs> to the rifts. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip this because I'm sure I'm talking too much. Um, so magnetism then, Where, how, in, how does magma rise into the rift over what kind of time scales? What can we learn? We have acquired, not just in the Ethiopian rift, I'll show you in a second, um, but in the southern part of the rift where, where basins are less than five million years old, uh, over the past uh, few decades, a large volume of data has been acquired. And working in through this area, I've had the privilege of working with some great data sets acquired by Peter McGuire and others and Aftab Khan um, uh, over the past few decades. Okay, uh, I also got to see this er eruption at Aldoni Langai, and even though it's a freak of nature, this active carbonatitic volcano is quite important as part of the, um, uh, and trying to understand the process. So here's this really young basin. <coughs> um, this is work I did with Steve Raker, um, some uh, students, uh, Christelle Tiberi in France, and her PhD student. And uh, anyway, these are receiver functions, so in crustal thinning, uh, superposed on top of a uh, slice through a crustal tomography <coughs> model. These are um, uh, VP anomaly variations. There's a thick sedimentary sequence, and the major structures are superposed on top. And these are the earthquake sequences. This is an area where there was a major dike intrusion in 2007, and then a volcanic eruption at Aldonia Langai. We're just, it's just off the out in front of you. Just, and this is just to the north of the volcano. And this is the magma body that um, is. We're presumably feeding Aldonia Langai. This is where the dike came up. And these are little stacked um, pancake-shaped areas. Here, there's several of them. On, or there are two on top of one another that we think are stacked sills. Uh, and these are the earthquake sequences, or the earthquakes from this, um, that my graduate student, Sarah Oliva, has been using full moment tensors. And they're showing some indications of non-double couple or, or um, uh, dilatational motion associated with magma intrusion. But the key part to walk away with is that magma has intruded into mid-crustal levels with perhaps stack sills and many um, uh, very significant mod uh, modification of the crust in about five million years. And this is at the edge of the Archean Craton. The Archean is just over here. And the xenoliths on either side of the rift, mantle xenoliths, are Archean. So this was underlain by perhaps very thickly rooted um, or thick craton prior to rifting. What we also measured, and this was important, is that along those fault systems bounding the rift, there were massive amounts of CO2. So the CO2 are the largest uh, soil gas uh, measurements that have been made anywhere, not just in Campi Flegri in Italy or other um, arc volcanoes. 
And they're coming up, they're concentrating along the two <laughs> fault systems on either side of the rift zone, and those are the same seismogenic faults I was showing you. Uh, so the fault zones penetrate to 25 kilometers. There's magmatic, in, where there's magmatic intrusion and the CO2 is coming up. The volume of CO2 at those kinds of rates is consistent with maybe five to, and the, the image magma volumes are in the range of five to 90 cubic kilometers per kilometer per million years, which are about the same as you get in the, um, oh, I'm doing well, um, as you get in the Aleutian arc, <coughs> where people have made the same kinds of measurements from seismic, but without adding the gas magma measurements. So, the key part of the gas is the gas, if you brought, bring a lot of magma up to the surface and intrude it, you have to degas. That gas may, the, primarily CO2, may be involved in uh, metamorphic reactions or it may uh, reach to the surface if they're active fault systems. Okay, um, I'm gonna move now quickly north to area, the Afar Depression, an area where Dan McKenzie in 1970 looked at the triple junction and published a seminal paper that we continue to refer to, uh, explaining the, the kinematics of the, the Afar Triple Junction, which is roughly here with Southern Red Sea rifting here, the Gulf of Aden in through here, and the main Ethiopian rift. Main Ethiopian rift is younger than the rest, so it was probably a double junction before the triple junction, or the East African Rift then developed. This is younger and less extended, but it's underlain by um, thin lithosphere and very uh, low shear wave velocities. There's a range of different papers. This is one of the, this is a young uh, postdoc now, and so I thought I'd highlight his paper, but they're all um, in indicative of uh, melt intrusions into the mantle lithosphere and up through the crust. So we're, able to produce large volumes of more than 25% of the crust is new igneous material. And this is prior to rupture, prior to breakup, or what we would recognize on a passive margin. We're producing uh, seaward dipping reflector sequences actively in through this zone right in here. So this is the kind of time average structure and the active deformation structure uh, shows how really important the magmatic process is or how hidden it has been until recently. When we think about plate boundary deformation, you think about <coughs> earthquakes and think about the strain, this elastic lithosphere, you store stress, um, you, um, and this, then release that in an earthquake. But where you have magma, that a lot of the, the magma itself is in accommodating the extension just along mid-ocean ridges, but it also is um, uh, relatively silent seismically. And it, it is, we're be, being able to um, quantify then those differences as well. So if you look at the 2005, so this sector of the East African Rift, a 65 to 70 kilometer long section, fed by a magma intrusion roughly from here, a magma chamber under here, uh, sh shot dikes north and south along an entire segment, and by the, when, when it was over with, there were more than 11 meters of opening across this area. Um, and these are scars, this has probably been happening for a continued period of time. These are rifted volcanoes, and this process then is somewhat similar to mid ocean ridge processes. The, the Topography can be created just by massive dike intrusion episodes stacked together. Uh, so in this sequence then, uh, there's the geodetic strain and there's the seismic strain. And so it was, it was literally less uh, than a tenth of the um, energy release, or the, the plate boundary strain, and it was more than 400 years of plate boundary deformation. So we think about slow movement of the plates and yet we now know even in rifts that much of that can be accommodated in, a, in what, you know, just a, a period of a couple of years. So the other part, of, I put this one in. This is another sequence. This is this seismic sequence. There wasn't any magma involved during this earthquake sequence in this basin. It's been amagmatic for at least 50,000 years. And you can see then that this seismic release is uh, about eight times greater. So seismic energy released during that rifting, and that produced fault systems of a few centimeters. This produced three to four meter fault um, uplift. So new way of looking, and then also a way of doing okay, the energy budget within the rift zone. So we've been missing these seismically silent magma intrusion episodes. 
and we're seeing the scars of these throughout large areas, it also changes the way that we look at hazards. Um, and, and throughout East Africa, with magnetism being a much larger hazard than had been previously interpreted. And finally, and magnetotellurics and, and combined seismic and magnetotellurics are bringing a new picture of the role of fluids, aqueous fluids, magmatic fluids, as they rise from the mantle through the plates. And this is just one example. This is uh, Desisted all Kathy Whaler was involved in the acquisition of data all across the same area. These are um, receiver functions from James Hammond shown in through here. This is where you would put the moho. Here's a magma chamber or interpreted as a lot, perhaps multiple magma chambers uh, with hot material beside and a relatively large volume. Uh, and showing then how uh, you know, seismicity uh, here and the active deformation zone um, with magma volumes though are affecting a much larger region and virtually new, all new igneous crust beneath the zone. So, um, okay. Uh, so, you know, just summarizing some of these points and also making bold statements that are supported by other published papers. Um, <coughs> feel free to ask me about, uh, I can point you to the evidence for these, but strain localization within the crust is, um, is influenced by the, the presence of volatiles. And with this widespread metasomatism, it provides a mechanism to thin, thick, cold, strong, um, uh, Cretonic lithosphere <coughs> early in the rift stage. Um, the apparently slow plate opening is maybe considerably faster than we thought when we just looked at seismic energy budgets. Rates of crustal growth in rift zones are comparable those to our, in arcs, and then we're also extending and adding new surface area. And so we need to look in terms of flexing uh, volatiles and water, or you know, CO2 in water and the carbon cycle. We also need to think about ways of creating new continental um, crust through the rifting process. Uh, okay, and then um, rapid stressing by magma intrusion, um, it can induce lower crustal fault zones and that are, uh, may be important in accommodating extension during rifting. Okay, and then now finally, just in finishing up, I wanted to show that these large magma volumes are not just exclusive to East Africa. Uh, new studies, part of the ERSCO program, Suzanne Vanderlee, my co colleague, a collaborator in, in this talk, has provided a whole series of cross sections across the mid-continent rift. These are the Great Lakes. This is the uh, Superior uh, Shield. This is a 1.1 billion year old rift system and has massive volumes of uh, volcanic material within the basins and <coughs> underplated zones that are at least 10 kilometers thick. And the plate's been happily supporting these loads without much in, uh, deformation or subsequent deformation, although the real foot fault system consider a bit further south has been uh, reactivated a couple of times. So some sectors of this rift haven't been reactivated, some have. Um, but we see this the very large volumes of new igneous material contained in rift systems. Uh, and the segmentation of this rift, you can see this now in Bouguet gravity anomalies from uh, North America. You can see this high-low pair as you move along. And some of the segmentation that you see here was uh, introduced by a subsequent deformation. And the final part, then, just as I finish up, um, as Earthscope has, um, to, wow, I can slow down. No. Uh, <laughs> um, these are these are just compilations of, um, or this is just sorry, this is just one of many shear wave velocity models showing uh, are comparable to the base of the lithosphere, and. This is a stable continental interior. Oh, but wait a minute. There are large lateral uh, velocity variations. This is minus 4% to more than 4%. And we see that northeastern North America, the Adirondack Mountains that are actively uplifting and have earthquakes, are, have a sharp edge or a contrast that may be you know, uh, active, or active uh, mantle dynamics. No, there are other areas with, throughout the eastern US, and we see magmatism associated with them as well. So stable continental material uh, interiors may not be particularly stable, and we could go all the way across the U.S. and see some of, um, you know, see more examples of dynamic topography or evidence for dynamic topography and indications of a more heterogeneous asthenosphere beneath continental interiors that's contributing to um, the Wilson cycle. Thank you. Uh, I think that
actually, this is more fun. So one of the folks, one of the people that hasn't been mentioned yet, but Tanya Atwater, um, uh, well, I, I love this quote uh, about, well, so how, you deal with tens of millions of years at a glance. I mean, how do you deal with that? And uh, it's a very, you feel very tiny and ephemeral and really humble. And I, uh, yeah, I'd like to just duplicate that and also say, um, yeah. Anyway, enjoy London. Thank you. Don't go away. Uh, any questions? Oh, thank you. That's great. We're asking questions. Must be one question. Yes, here we go. Do you want to? I'm intrigued that with the fluxing of the CO2 through this lot you're referring and trying to track down just through the, effectively the crustal area. But to produce CO2, presumably you, one's looking at a dehydration unmixing, which actually is probably occurring about 175 kilometers depth. And that's probably the origin of the carbonatite unmixing and yeah, the volatiles, There's but below that East African rift area. My, my collaborator, Toby Fisher, would argue that, that you can fractionate the carbonatite and the lower crustal magma chamber from a slightly carbonated mantle plume, and you don't need to tap on unusual sources. The magmas are, are you know, we know that they're, they're there's elevated water content and there's CO2 degassing throughout. There are carbonatites in Uganda, there are carbonatites <coughs> in southwestern Tanzania. There are many associated with the early stage. And, and so, uh, you know, that, the amount of CO2 that we're fluxing is consistent with the volumes of basaltic magmas that are intruded into the crust that are through, it, if assuming that the entire breadth of the rift zone in these areas, the magmatic areas, um, have a couple of kilometers or more of underplate. And so, but it has to be active if we're seeing the CO2 now. And so it's the level of activity in the magmatic system that's quite important that I'm trying to emphasize, that it's more active than we would have anticipated. Great, thanks. <laughs> so we're going to continue the theme of active deformation of the continents. And Richard Walker from Oxford is going to talk about active tectonics of Turkmenistan and the South Caspian region. Okay, good afternoon. So, yes, I'm going to be talking uh, about the South Caspian Basin, but especially what we can learn about the South Caspian Basin by looking at those parts of its margins that are exposed uh, on land. In particular, oh, in particular, the margin that we see in, in, in Turkmenistan. This is the, uh, the main Copet Dog Strike Slip Fault. And these are places where we can make measurements both using satellites and also by, by visiting and, and, and making measurements in, in the field. The uh, range of people that I have here uh, as, as authors are those that have been involved in the, uh, the field campaigns that we, we started last year. So uh, people from Oxford University, Cambridge University, uh, also um, collaborators in the Institute of Seismology in the Republic of Turkmenistan. So where are we looking at? We are looking at the South Caspian Basin here. And you have a, a, a plate tectonic story. You have the uh, conversions between Arabia and, 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 and Eurasia, which is uh, the longitudes we're interested in is about 25 millimeters per year north-south convergence. We also have the kind of continental tectonic story. You can see uh, widespread uh, epicenters of earthquakes, these red dots, also widespread mountainous topography. So, so you have that shortening accommodated over a very wide zone. But quite prominently within there, the South Caspian Basin does, does, does not have earthquakes, right? So this seems to be uh, a block, a, 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 a plate, call it what you will, something that is, is, is caught within that deforming zone but is doing something, but is, 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 is not deforming itself. And this area has been, you know, has a long history of study, uh, going back into um, uh, in, in, into the days of the of the Soviet Union, uh, within the northern parts and its interior, and also within Iran as well. I, I I'm going to start with with this uh, review and uh, and synthesis that was was done by James Jackson, Mark Allen, Keith Priestley, Manuel Barbarian in 2002 where they took what was known and, 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 and tried to place this into a, into a regional 
context. So you can see the South Caspian Basin here. It's kind of enigmatic in, in terms of, 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 of what it is. Um, you know, it's, it's potentially some kind of remnant ocean uh, basin with uh, a, a sediment pile on top reaching up to thicknesses of, of, of 20 kilometers. There are, there's deformation and fold axes within that sediment pile, but, but as I said, no, no, no large earthquakes. And so this seems to be decoupled from what's happening in the basement, which is uh, apparently nothing within the basin itself. Around its edges, however, you do have earthquakes and you have active faults. And so the, the basin seems to be moving relative to all of its surroundings. Uh, in the northeast, you have right lateral faulting. In the east, you have right lateral faulting. In the southeast, you have left lateral faulting, which as it swings around, turns more to thrusting all the way around its western edge. And at the northern edge, you, you, you again have uh, uh, thrusting, but, but the difference is that those um, earthquakes go deeper. Right? So you have um, um, a focal depths down to about uh, 70 kilometers or so. The rest of the area around here, the seismicity is restricted to 30 kilometers or less. And so what they did in this paper was, well, this is a summary of, of, of all of those things that I mentioned, but also there were some other things that, that, that could be stated. You know, what, are the, what is the motion of the South Caspian Basin relative to Iran, and what is the motion relative to Eurasia? Well, as you swing round, the left lateral faulting disappears at some point, so you say, okay, well, that's likely to be reflecting the, the motion of the South Caspian Basin relative to Iran. Also, we know that along its northeastern edge, we have right lateral faulting plus some shortening. So it gives some limit on what the, uh, the, est uh, what, what the direction of the South Caspian motion should be to Eurasia, i.e. it should be slightly north of the line of the Coppet Dog. One other thing that, we, uh, that, 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 that you, you, you could put in here is the, is the total uh, convergence between Iran and Eurasia. And that was estimated in this paper to be 15 to 20 millimetres per year in a north-south manner. Remember, this is before there were any GPS velocities available for this region, right? So what was done was the overall plate convergence was taken. There was a, 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 about 10, it was known that there was about 10 millimetres per year of shortening across the Zagros. So you minus that and say everything else is in the northern edge. So they came up with about 15 to 20 from... <laughs> GPS velocities that have been published more recently, we'd, we'd put that at 15 millimetres per year, right? So it's at the, the lower end of that range. If you produce a, a velocity triangle, using the, the, the other things that I've mentioned here, 13 to 17 millimetres per year between the Caspian and Iran, and, and, and 7 to 10 millimetres per year between the Caspian and Eurasia, with an with azimuth, something like this, right? Okay. And we're looking at the lower end of those estimates. There's also a suggestion that everything is quite young uh, because there's a change in polarity, the thrusting uh, at, the, at the eastern and western edges compared to the thrusting in the South Caspian Basin itself, which would have a, a tendency to kind of m misalign those structures if they've been going for long periods of time. So perhaps it's quite useful as well. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the, 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 the state in 2002. And we have... A couple of questions. We want to know, first of all, what the motion of the South Caspian Basin is relative to its surroundings, how fast, what direction, for how long. Um, and I'm going to say that what we're going to try and do is by making measurements at its eastern end, right? Because most of the Caspian Sea, most of the Caspian Basin is actually covered by water. And so therefore, we can't make the measurements directly. So what we're going to try and do is to look at the, the areas in Turkmenistan and also in this eastern part of Iran as well. The second thing is to look at earthquake hazard. These are long fault systems. Strike slip, left lateral here, right lateral there. Potentially quite rapid slip. And so we may also, uh, and, and we may experience large magnitude earthquakes, and we may um, uh, we, we we may expect them to happen quite rapidly, uh, quite often. And yet, the only very large earthquake along either of these fault systems was this one in 856 AD, the Cumis earthquake, uh, which has an estimated magnitude of 7.9 and potentially killed up to 200,000 people. This is the city of Cumis now. You can still see it in satellite images, uh, the, the, the ruins sticking out above this, uh, well, um, all, all, a disused uh, lake bed, actually, probably early Holocene lake bed. And uh, we 
have a good idea that this earthquake did occur upon one of those large left lateral fault systems. This was a paper by James Hollingsworth et al. in 2010. Uh, trenching result, you see uh, a faulting that cuts layers at 772 to uh, whatever that is, 906 calendar years BC, but does not seem to displace the, these medieval uh, 13 to 1300s, 1350 AD layers. So, so this seems to be the source of that earthquake, right? Okay. Apart from that, those boundaries haven't really sustained the large earthquakes that, 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 that would, would be equivalent to that one. Okay, so as I said, we want to know what the motion of the, the South Caspian Basin is, but most of it is covered by water. Um, the first attempt to, 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 look at, to, to measure this using GPS was this one by Jamor et al. in 2010. Um, they used GPS stations along the, the, the northern edge of the Albors Mountains, so the southern shore of the South Caspian Basin, and they said, okay, we can fit all of these with a pole of rotation of the Caspian relative to Eurasia, which is very close to the Caspian Basin itself. Uh, that has the implication that it would predict a very uh, sl or relatively slow slip rate along the eastern margin. So the, the rates are actually decreasing quite rapidly as you go towards that, 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 that boundary. So we should be able to uh, test this in some way if we can measure the rate of slip across that, across that fault. But also, those stations are right at the edge of the mountains. It's a very narrow coastal slip. So do we know whether they're actually showing the motion of the Caspian Basin itself, or are they showing, uh, or are they contaminated by uh, the accumulation of strain along that boundary itself? So this brings us to um, um, Zara Masavi, who did a, a PhD at the University of Grenoble, uh, under well, with my supervision also under um, Andrea Wolpersdorf and Erwin Pathier, who uh, measure or made a GPS network that covered northeastern Iran, and in particular they measured two points which were separated by several kilometers but gave uh, coherent results, these <coughs> ones here, which don't fit with, 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 with the rotation suggested by Jamur et al. If you take the best fitting pole for all of the GPS around here, it moves somewhere over here. But actually you might say, well, you know, maybe these things shouldn't be included at all. It means we don't have many data points left, but we really just have this one, right? Because they're right next to each other. So you're not going to define a pole of rotation, but it, it, it at least it can help you to put some limits on what the motion of the Ashkabat fault might be. And that limit would be if we just put a profile all the way from D to D, D prime to D, and just show the changes in velocity as we go along there. And we can see that you have a jump as you cross this zone of right lateral faulting, and there is a total uh, change of about 7.5 millimetres per year across there. So that might be a maximum limit on, on, on what the, the, uh, the motion at the boundary would be. We can also use satellite radar, and this is what Zara did. She had ascending and descending tracks to measure the strain accumulation across the Iranian uh, boundary, right, this, this, this eastern al Bors boundary, and she could see uh, a, a, a signal within there. You can put that into a, a, a this is line of sight um, uh, profile. She's also superimposed the GPS on there. You get good agreement between the radar and the GPS, suggesting four to five and a half millimeters per year across the southeastern boundary. That also seems to agree with what we uh, uh, know from the geological slip rates in this area. And reminder, no historical earthquakes uh, of, of, of large earthquakes in, in, in this area in history. INSAR has been tried on that boundary, but, but actually there's, there's quite a lot of problems with the atmospheric noise, so uh, it only gives a very wide range. GPS, as I say, we've basically got one point, could be anywhere between three millimetres per year and 7.5, so this is why we, or one motivation, why we would try and go into the field. And this is what that, 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 that Turkmenistan uh, main Kobet dog fault looks like in the field. It's incredibly clear. It's incredibly impressive. Right? It's an amazing uh, place. I, was, I felt very honoured to, to, to actually go and, and, and see this in the field. Uh, looking along it, again, another field photo. Um, 
It's very remote, but we had this as our field vehicle, which would take us anywhere. The only place that blocked us was uh, we had to go under a railway track, and the uh, underpass was just simply too small to accommodate our, our giant field vehicle. So we had to make an amendment as far as that goes. It's also very clear in satellite imagery as well. And so this is the main uh, strike slip fault cutting through there. You can see displacements. This is unfairly uh, prominent because it's got a highway built down it. Okay. <laughs> Um, but you can restore elements of the, of the landscape, the drainage, with 100, 250 metres, actually 750 metres. Uh, it, it, it seems to be the total displacement uh, since that, those elements in the landscape were formed. Dating them, this is what it looks like, big alluvial fan systems, we dug pits. I can't give you the final ages back. They, 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 were, they were measured. This is a, um, uh, infrared stimulated luminescence, a burial dating method. Um, preliminary ages that I got yesterday suggest on the order of 100,000 years, right? But that uh, may, may change. If that's the case, 750 m uh, uh, meters, order of 100,000 years, we are looking at the upper end of, 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 of the slip rates that have been suggested. So, quite fast rates along the boundaries here, uh, predominantly strike slip. A motion of the, of the South Caspian relative to Eurasia some, somewhat in this direction. It, it, it actually seems to be very close to the, uh, to, to the uh, numbers that were in that original paper in 2002. You have to have extension between Iran and, and the South Caspian here. That's probably one way you can do that is by having these right lateral faults accommodating that extension through the rate, vertical axis rotation of the blocks. And in terms of timing, probably quite young. You can uh, accommodate the whole 30 kilometers of displacement on those faults in just a few million years. Also, paleo -mag, uh, magnetic rotations suggest that most of the action was occurring within the last uh, four million years as well. And as a final note about earthquakes, there was a big destructive earthquake in 1948 in, uh, in Ashgabat. This is Ashgabat here. The, uh, the intensities from that earthquake suggest that this thrust fault was the source of that earthquake. Prior to that, these are the records of earthquakes around Ashgabat. 200 BC in Nyssa, it's an ancient uh, Parthian capital. You can see a fault scarp cutting through the middle of it. Uh, and 2000 BC at Akdepe, a Bronze Age mound, again close to Ashgabat. The main Kobet Dark Fault does not have a historical record of large earthquakes, but just to show you that if you look at this in, in, in um, good, good satellite imagery, here we see very coherent five meter displacements even cutting through the active riverbed. So we think there is or has been a large magnitude earthquake in this area in the last centuries to, to, to thousand years. This is our target for what we want to go on and, and, and study in the coming year. And um, thank you for your attention. Time, time for a couple of quick questions. Here at the front. Uh, it's uh, John Ankoff from Oslo again. Um, I worked for a while on the Chelakem Peninsula, which is the uh, eastern end of the Apsheron Sill. Uh, we were doing oil stuff. Um, and this, I, I note you had subduction zone along the Apsheron Sill, but it must be very, very deep because we, we see huge flower structures along that uh, fault system. And while we were there, we usually felt a, f a noticeable earthquake once a week mm -hmm. as, uh, as the fault slipped. So the, well, there I, seemed I, to be a lots of little ones. Yeah, for sure. So, so yeah, you, you get earthquakes going down to about 70 kilometers or so in that area. And that's the only part that, that you do. So maybe you are seeing the initiation of a subduction zone. I would love to see the data that you guys were looking at to see that in, 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 in the subsurface, but I have not, I have not done so. Yeah. Lady Lonergan Imperial College. I think there are seismic data that show that subduction zone now. I've seen it with mm -hmm. BP data. There's Ooh, clearly yeah. a subduction zone mm. beneath the Ashburn Ridge. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I would love to see. Amazing data. Great. On that note, thank you. Right, and um, the next talk is going to be given by Tim Rice from Leeds about the very exciting topic of bringing space technology to bear on the problem of <coughs> continental deformation. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess when you put this talk together, you don't quite think through who's going to be in the audience when you're talking about continental tectonics. So I'm somewhat nervous about speaking to some of the, the great names who are here. Um, 
so I thought, okay, I'll stick to the data. What, we, what we've got now that we didn't have um, in the 60s and 70s is just incredible data. And then I read um, Dan McKenzie's abstract for his talk, and he said uh, all these, these fantastic data, and we haven't learned anything new from them. So that punctured my <laughs> bubble again. Um, nevertheless, I'm going to try and show you some um, beautiful data that we now have from, uh, from the continents, both from the GPS... Um, and there are now, there's been a really huge effort over the last uh, 20 years or so. There's more than a, a something like 20,000 GPS sites measured across the continents in the latest compilations. Um, but at the same time, we've also got a data from satellite radar interferometry, um, including new data that we're processing within Comet, um, which shows um, deformation across the whole Alpine Himalayan belt. You can go on our website and download those. So I want to focus on two things and really think about how plate tectonics operates in, in continental interiors in this talk. So I'm, I'm going to start in Turkey um, and then go to the um, India-Asia collision zone. Um, so again, no talk in, in, in Turkey starts with, probably without, without this, this figure. And of course, um, essentially, um, Dan worked out the answer back in, uh, back in 1970. What we have now, of course, is a lot more... Um, data, so I, you know, I'm in awe of how um, they're able to get this picture from the from the very limited uh, earthquake data. Essentially, the GPS confirmed that overall simple story, but actually, when you look at the details, it's slightly more complex. You can see here's the North Anatolian fault, um, <coughs> which essentially marks a small circle around a plate of a polar rotation somewhere south of of, of Cyprus. Um, what we wanted to do though was look at how well uh, Turkey, which is often, uh, often cited as the classic tectonic microplate, how, how much like a plate is it, really? So to do that, we combined the INSAR with GPS. This was huge work by uh, a PhD student, Akbal Hussein, working with data from the Envisat satellite from the European Space Agency. Combining that with the GPS data, you can extract the east-west velocities uh, there on the left and the vertical velocities. Essentially, those east-west velocities show the relative motion of Anatolia with, um, and this narrow zone of, of, uh, where the colour changes as you go across the fault, showing the strain accumulation across it. The vertical motions are largely non-tectonic. Non they're, they're to do with hydrology, um, largely, and mostly within a few millimetres of zero. If we look at a series of profiles across the fault, what you can see is actually it's a remarkably simple story. Almost everywhere you look, you see these, um, these are profiles of the fault parallel velocity as a function of distance. And where you see that change, um, that slope, is where the fault is. You're seeing the accumulation of elastic strain that's building up uh, uh, towards the, the next earthquake in, in, in this location. This is all interseismic strain accumulation. We can take those data and we can look at the slip rate for each of those faults. Um, and you can plot those as a function of distance along the fault. And what you'd expect, of course, if it is a, if it is a, a plate rotation and it's around a small circle, you'd expect that to be a constant. Um, well, it's nearly a constant, but actually it increases, and it shows a gradual in increase from the east uh, to the west from about 22 to 26 millimetres per year, which, of course, is incompatible with Anatolia being a single rigid plate and requires internal deformation of Anatolia. You can see that if you, count, if you plot a strain map. This is just a magnitude of strain, the second invariant of the strain rate tensor. And while you've got that beautiful red band across the north um, associated with the North Anatolian Fault with incredibly high um, interseismic strain rates, you've also got, quite, uh, you've got elevated strain that's distributed across uh, central Anatolia and, of course, high rates uh, in western Anatolia where you've got extension. Let's go to the India-Asia collision. Um, and, of course, any consideration of, of continental tectonics has to, has to come here. It's the largest deforming area on the planet. Here's the topography and, and some of the major faults. Um, and it's a, obviously a large area, a huge amount of seismicity um, that's taken place and been recorded here with the uh, CMT solutions. Um, <coughs> it's been a, a, an area that's been controversial in terms of how you model um, uh, continental tectonics. Um, and I'm slightly hesitant at framing it in this way, but it's been a way this argument has been framed for many years. It's been a kind of a contrast, really, between where the plate tectonics works 
um, in, but the plates are smaller, we have small microplates on the continents, um, or whether we have a, a distributed more of a continuum model. Um, and so in the microplate model, we consider crustal blocks as, as these small uh, plates. They just act like regular plates in the oceans. They can rotate and translate, but deformation is only allowed along their boundaries. And of course, they must all be fully isolated. And there's been a series of these, uh, these models that have gradually got more compli complicated over the years. Uh, the first one, I think, was by um, Avowak and, and colleagues in, in, in 1993 that had four blocks. Uh, with, this was constrained by um, slip rates on, on the faults. Um, Chen et al. in JGR had four um, deforming blocks um, that, to, to fit um, GPS. Um, Thatcher used 11 uh, blocks to fit 349 GPS. Lovelace and Mead had 24 blocks to fit 731 um, GPS. The latest model I could find was from Wang et al. In, in this year that had 30 blocks and, and nearly 2,000 GPS. So the general story here is the more observations we're getting, the, more, the smaller these, these plates need to be, um, which is probably telling us something that the, these models aren't particularly useful in, in predicting the future. So the... the, um, the Contrast has been to use viscous continuum models. So the, the first of these was um, England and Hausman um, in 86, the first, of, the first application to the India-Asia collision. Um, again, this was just a forward prediction, largely to match the topography. Um, Neil and Hausman added in a rigid terrain um, basin. Um, the first model that used GPS was, uh, was by uh, Flesch et al. Um, in 2001, and that, had, um, that required spatially varying rheology to match about 350 GPS sites. And again, the most recent one here I could find was from 2014. This is a 3D viscous model that has str a strong terrene basin, a strong Sichuan basin, um, and also some, some of the faults being weak in order to match uh, about f uh, just over 500 GPS in that case. So again, the, the, the observation here is that the more data we've got and the faster computers are getting, the, the, the more complex these models have, have become. So I wanted to try and take a step back from that debate and have a look at what the data actually show us. And, and I've been involved in some work led by some Chinese collaborators um, to, uh, that's just come out in JGR that has, um, it's a really remarkable data set. We've got more than 2,500 GPS velocities across all of the uh, India-Asia collision, a really beautiful um, velocity field. Um, and so this is, if you take that velocity field and you calculate the strain rates from it, this is a, a map of the, just the magnitude of, of the strain rate, 10 to the second invariant. Again, the red colors show the high strain zones. Um, and what I wanted to do was just to pull out the, the key features that I think characterize continental deformation in this area and then use those to evaluate, um, evaluate models. So I think one key feature is that there are large uh, regions that are relatively undeforming. So um, there's relatively few earthquakes in, in, the, in the Indian plate. There are some. Um, but we also, in the Sichuan Basin in South China, in the Tarim um, and the Ordos blocks, it's, there are, there's relatively little deformation, relatively low strain rates. There are areas, however, with very high strain rates. So the one that leaps out, of course, is the Himalayan frontal thrust and the Saigang Fault, uh, the Altintal Fault, the Kunlun Fault, um, the, um, the Tian Shan. There's some very high strain rates there. So there are areas of focus strain around some of the major structures, but not all of them. Um, you can see those concentrations for, in individual profiles, for example, crossing the Altintal Fault here. Um, these are profiles now um, of the fault parallel velocity. Again, you can see the location of the fault. A key point to mention here again is that the slip rate varies along these structures. So they start off with low slip rates, they have high slip rates in the middle and they tail off again towards, towards the ends. As well as those um, high strain rates, there are, there are areas with, with high, relatively high strain where you can't really pin it down to individual structures. So notably in kind of central and western Tibet, but also um, north of the Tian Shan in Mongolia. Um, and I think, that, I think the data are good enough now that that's not just a, a function of, of the paucity of data. They're really, um, it's very hard to pin down strain concentrations there. You can see it in profiles. This is a somewhat complex diagram, so I'm going to draw your eye to this one profile, which uh, crosses the whole plateau, and this is a profile of the fault perpendicular velocities, and essentially it's um, a straight line between the Himalayan frontal thrust and the Altintag. 
if we look at this profile of uh, east-west uh, uh, velocities, again, this, this is um, uh, profile parallel velocities. And what you can see, again, a straight line, very, very difficult to pin down any deformation there to individual structures. The final key feature I think that you can see is when you just look at the dilatation. So um, this is, um, so Tibet is contracting in a north-south sense and extending in an east-west sense. And the difference between those tells you whether, um, whether you're extending or not. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, really a repeat of, of work done by um, um, G. Molnar and others um, a few years ago, but with a, just a slightly updated data set. And essentially, we get the same, same answer. What you see very nicely is this dilatation uh, within the high region of Tibet that's approximately bounded by, the, by this 4,750-metre contour. So these high areas are extending. There's no real difference between the north and the south. So um, some models have the um, dilatation uh, being just due to the kind of curvature of the Himalayan front. But we see, um, just like GSL did, we see a very similar um, dilatation rate in the north and the south. Um, so those are the key features. How do our, our, our kind of N-member models do? Well, I mean, both block models, microplate models, and continuum models um, they both are able to produce large undeforming regions. In continuum-type models, we need to impose those through strength contrasts. Um, neither model really does very well at producing strain focused around some major faults. So, uh, so block models do it, of course, around all of the boundaries, but we don't really see that within the data. We see isolated structures that don't surround um, individual uh, uh, microplates. And continuum models... Um, a struggle to produce the kinds of strain concentrations we see um, in the geodesy. Um, areas of diffuse strain, um, this is something, of course, continuum models do very well and block models. You can do it, but you have to make your blocks smaller and smaller and smaller, which is what we've seen as the data has got better. Um, dilatation of the high plateau is something you can do in, in, in a continuum model. So really, microplates don't work in the continents. Um, and um, Really, I think probably the continuum of models don't really work yet either. They don't give us that kind of picture that we actually see, but perhaps um, have the potential to get there in the future. Just a short word on seismic hazard. Um, the si and really what I wanted to stress here is that the seismic hazard isn't focused only on the large major structures. We need to worry about these, the diffuse strain away from those major structures. So some conclusions. Um, Satellite geodesy is really sharpening our view of how the continents deform. Um, and, and in a sense, Dan is right in terms of learning things new. So I think in terms of our conclusions about, um, about continental tectonics, I think one of them I've just taken as a straight quote from Mackenzie 1972, that it's not possible to describe the tectonics of continents in terms of the motion of a few large aseismic plates. Um, and, and these are the features we need for future models of continental <coughs> tectonics. We need to recognize strain con strength contrasts, strain localizations around some uh, major structures and um, internal buoyancy forces. Thank you. Any questions? So we'll move on to the next talk, which is Bob White, who's going to bring us back to um, mid-ocean ridges. And Bob is going to talk about the spreading plate boundary at Iceland. Thank you. Yes, uh, Iceland's a nice place to study a plate boundary uh, because it's above sea level. Of course, that makes it anomalous because it's above a plume. Um, but we had a, the great good fortune to capture a dike intrusion um, a couple of years ago. That's what I'm going to talk about. <coughs> The spreading segments are typically 100 kilometers long in Iceland. They're the yellow things on this slide. Uh, it's similar in oceans. And we know in oceans that probably lava spreads along each segment. So there's a commonality to the geochemistry along each segment. The same is true here. And what I'm going to show you is, uh, as I say, a dike intrusion that we've captured going along a segment. 
Uh, spreading rate's about 20 millimetres a year, full rate. Slightly oblique, you'll notice, uh, to the strike of the spreading segments. That's going to be important. Well, this is the dike intrusion we captured. Uh, there's 30,000 earthquakes here. It travelled from the source, volcano on the left, nearly 50 kilometres laterally before it erupted. Now, it was going down a topographic slope, so it erupted in a low. Uh, it erupted 1.8 cubic kilometres of melt over six months. And I'll show you in a minute that the erupted melt equals the substance in the Badabunga volcano on the bottom left where it came from. So it's a one-to-one -one balance. That went down and it came out the other end. <laughs> well, we had the good fortune to have 72 receivers out at the time because we were doing tomography around Askia, which is the next volcanic system north. Uh, and this dike actually very kindly drove right into the middle of our array. Um, I was sitting at home at the time, and one of my students, who's Icelandic, uh, managed to blag her way onto a helicopter within 24 hours of the seismicity starting. Uh, and she deployed these um, stations on the ice. Uh, we sort of guessed where it was going and got it just right. Uh, we happened to have 15 seismometers in Reykjavik waiting to ship back. Uh, so I was sitting at home watching this progressing north in a way we just saw just now. So I thought, where is it going to erupt? Well, this is a low point. So we put 15 seismometers out there. And the last one was deployed at 10.30 one night. The eruption started half past midnight the next day. Um, and it actually erupted through um, an 1870 eruption in the same site. Came up through the same craters, in fact. Um, and this is one of the ones very close to the eruption site, one of our sites. And it had to be removed very quickly. It made the front page of the newspaper here. <laughs> Uh, this lava front was coming forward about a metre a minute. So um, these are very delicate instruments. You're supposed to lock them and be very careful. You just pick them up and threw them in the car. <laughs> I'm glad to say. <laughs> now, these are those 30,000 earthquakes along the dike. It's a slightly unusual plot, so I just need to explain it a bit. Along the bottom is the two weeks of the dike propagation. Uh, a stands for August, from the 16th to the 31st. And up the side is the distance along the dike. So that means that the slope of this front edge of the seismicity is the rate of propagation of the front of the dike. And it's typically progressing at two, between two and four kilometres an hour. Uh, but it does it in segments. So it will go forward five to ten kilometres, then it stalls for maybe one day or two days, then it goes forward, then it stalls, goes forward. It stalled for 84 hours here, and then went forward another seven or eight kilometres, and so on. So... That's one point to notice. It goes forward episodically. The other thing to notice is that the seismicity is just in the front 5 to 10 kilometres of the dike. It's completely aseismic here, behind it. The eruption's at 45 kilometres from the source, and there's no seismicity at all in these 35 kilometres. And yet we know the melt is moving from the source to the eruption site. So it's a good lesson that the seismicity doesn't tell you everything that's happening. The melt flows aseismically. And in fact, Cindy just told us that the, um, the moment release from the seismicity was, was about 10% of the uh, total release. Well, we can, we can calculate the geodetic moment very easily because this dike opened about four metres um, in two weeks. Uh, and we can add up the moments of the earthquakes. They are about 1%. The seismic moment is 1% of the total energy release from opening that dike. Not surprising, you only see earthquakes at the front. Once it's cracked to crack open, it just opens more or less aseismically and the melt flows through it. Well, I'm going to blow up the, the, the northern edge, uh, northern part of this dike, and you can see the same picture as before, the dike advancing, stopping, advancing, stopping, overshooting a bit, in fact, and then erupting just here. Um, the earthquakes are very tightly constrained at six kilometres depth below sea level. Uh, and this scatter is just the uncertainty. And the green ones show you the, the fault type. They're all strike slip faults, they're all left lateral, except for a few red ones. Uh, what's the reason for that? This is a rift zone, and yet all the faults are strike slip. Uh, and they're very well constrained strike slip if you're used to looking at fault plane solutions. Um, the fault is like looking down on top of it, if you like, from a bird's eye view. This is the fault here. It's constrained to within a couple of degrees by the change from positive to negative and very high <coughs> signal to noise. These are all our seismic stations. Not much doubt about the strike of that fault. 
Well, why are they left lateral strike slip? Um, this, the fabric here is about 38 degrees. Oops, let's just go back. Uh, the strike of the fault is about 25 degrees, and that's just following the topographic load, and it erupts in a, in a low just here, because then it goes uphill again to the next volcano. Um, so if you uh, plot these up, they're incredibly tight. Um, the fault planes are about 38 degrees. The strike of the dike is 25 for the left laterals. For the right laterals, uh, it's displaced the other side um, with the same strike of the fault. Uh, well, of the dike, I mean. How can this happen? Well, this is uh, looking down on that dike, which is travelling at 025 degrees. If you use a simple Moore diagram, you'd expect uh, faults at 30 to 60 degrees on each side. But if there's high pore fluid pressure, uh, that reduces that angle. Uh, and so we're seeing left lateral faults on this side, right lateral on that side. Um, and you remember the spreading was oblique. Uh, it's at 106 degrees here. It's slightly oblique to the fault system. So actually, to accommodate this failure here, you need left lateral motion. Um, this right lateral side, the red one, is absolutely <coughs> perpendicular to the spreading direction, and so mostly it's just failing in mode one failure, just opening a little bit. And once you've opened a crack, you can then just expand it uh, with melt. Well, that was a dike. Let's look at the source. Uh, the Badabunga volcano, here's the caldera. It's under ice, 80 square kilometres. And during the eruption, it subsided 65 metres as the melt was evacuated from it. Uh, and you can see from a GPS which was put right in the caldera uh, that there's an exponential decay. This blue line is the important one. Um, the red shows the melt volume that's extruded. Uh, this is exponential, um, fits a exponential curve, the dotted one, very accurately. And you can explain the melt flow uh, stopping at the end of February here, um, by flow through about a 10-metre diameter tube, flowing just between laminar and turbulent flow. Um, and then it stops when you've lost the 65 metres of pressure head. Um, so if you look at the earthquakes in the caldera, um, there were a lot of them, um, 85 greater than magnitude 5, but they're all in the top few kilometres, uh, and the melt is moving. Uh, this is the two weeks of that uh, intrusion at 6 kilometres depth. Well, that's the one I just showed you. The size of the dots is proportional to the magnitude of the earthquakes. Um, and you can see that was the two-week intrusive period. This was the six-month eruptive period. Um, the earthquake's much smaller in the dike, but big still in the caldera as that collapses above the magma chamber. And then in the post-eruptive bit, you get smaller again earthquakes as the melt is cooling and it actually delineates the track of the dike again. Um, still settling in the top of the cold air, but smaller earthquakes again. So, very simple story. Now, I want to talk about the melt feed. Uh, interestingly, there is a source of deep seismicity um, offset from the caldera. Uh, here it is in an east-west view across the caldera. There's an extremely abrupt base uh, to the seismicity in the caldera at about seven kilometres depth. And that's where the magma chamber, therefore, must be. Absolutely nothing beneath it. But there's earthquakes coming from 20 kilometres up to 6, offset here. They're active through each year. Um, and it's in the ductile zone. You only get earthquakes in the ductile zone if there's a high strain rate. You only get a high strain rate if there's melt movement. And probably that's triggered here by exolution of CO2 from these mafic melts, which starts at about 20 kilometres. The rate in here actually doesn't see the eruption, which is the orange bit. It just carries on, and it's carried on for the five years that we've been monitoring it so far. These are pretty tiny earthquakes. Um, so let me show you an animation. Each year is a different color, just to show you the whole height is active uh, throughout. Uh, now, I want you to look just at this gap here. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the dike propagation. Um, but you can see that the dike came out of the caldera, then there's a gap in seismicity, then it propagated northeast. Gap in seismicity means it's hot. It's not having to crack its way forward. There's probably melt there. So probably what's happening um, is that the melt is feeding up here. Uh, it's <coughs> flowing laterally. It likes to be in sills. Um, and there's some melt sitting around there. So when the dike propagates, it can zip through that region very quickly and then carry on to its eruption site later on. 
Now, ironically, I don't think this is the main melt feed, because if it were, it would have to move across and then come back again. Um, because we see seismicity, it's probably pretty cold. There's probably not that much melt moving. Um, so probably the main melt feed beneath the caldera uh, is from below, and it's aseismic. And it's probably um, stalling at sills at various heights. And that's actually picked up as well by the geochemistry of the erupted material. Um, equilibrium, whoops, just go back. The equilibrium between um, these components of melt plagioclase and clinoproxene give about a six <coughs> kilometer depth, which is where the magma chamber and the flow is. But some clinoproxene geobarometers say, well, there's melt stalling at 12 kilometers or something like that. So it probably stalls in deeper levels before it erupts. Well, just the last uh, couple of slides, let me just uh, show you what we were doing uh, when this happened. We were trying to look at tomography around Ascia, which last er erupted in 64, with a big eruption in 1875, which created this big caldera here. Um, again, these are earthquakes down at 15 kilometres. There's clusters all along the rift zone at depth. And if we look at a plan view at 6 kilometres depth, you can see the magma storage area. Uh, in the P wave velocity is depressed, the shear wave velocity is depressed, the ratio of P to S velocity is increased. This is where the main melt storage area is before the eruption. And if we look in a vertical cross section going east-west through it, uh, then this is that main melt storage, but there are sills going out from it, there is other melt beneath it, there are clusters of seismicity at different depths. So the point I want you to take away really is that the eruptive part, which geologists love to look at, of course, is only a very small part of the melt that's around in the system. Most of the melt freezes in situ in the mid and lower crust. You probably only erupt 10% uh, of it or something like that. Um, so most of what's going on, building the um, plate boundary, uh, it's built in dikes, but then in between the diking events, there's melt sitting around, intruding into sills. Some of it's moving up, but most of it's freezing in situ. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions? Bob, the focal mechanism solutions are you associate with dike propagation. adjacent to the dike in the wall rock is also would cause strike slip earthquakes as well. Are you possibly seeing both and are you helping us understand this cooling process as well? Yeah, I, that's very likely. I mean, as you know, when, when melt cools, it goes through a glass transition. And if it cools at the edge of the dike, it immediately comes very strong. So the place you're going to get fracturing is at the edge of the dike. When it's only just below solid, as, uh, actually, if it cools some more, it gets weaker again. So you might, be, you might be fracturing there, you might be fracturing just outside the dike. Uh, the resolution of the seismics doesn't tell you um, where the seismicity is, as you know, not to that resolution of meters. Um, but quite likely, yes, you're, you're fracturing the side parallel to the dike using the same fault system. So you're getting strike step fault in there as well, because that regional stress field is still sitting there. Rob Butler, Aberdeen. Um, your jerky propagation of the uh, of the dike. Do you, do you think that might be due to sort of supply issues of the magma or is it being pinned by some sort of heterogeneity in the, in the upper crust or, or something else? Yeah, it, I think it's both. If, if you'd looked very tight, uh, well, I don't know if we've got time to go back, but, you, but oh, <laughs> some going forwards. Uh, if you go back and look at it, you'll see that there's a quiet zone behind it each time. So it's as if, let's... Uh, Go back just a little bit more. Here we are, this one, let's go to this one. Um, you can see that as it goes forward, then there's a quiet zone behind it, and then that gradually builds up with seismicity, right? And you can see this many times. Uh, so I think what it is, there's a high pressure head, it uses up the pressure cracking forwards, and then you're building up the pressure again behind it, it's <coughs> cracking behind it, and then it's got enough to go forward. So that's part of the story. But part of the story also is that I think there are strength um, boundaries at these points. 
um, because if you look hard, you can see a stripe of seismicity here um, at that particular distance. Normally, that means that you've, you've got um, something... Well, you can see it here very clearly. Oh, go back. Yeah, you can see it across here very, cl very clearly. Uh, you worry that that's something in your velocity model. That's not the case here. We've looked very hard, and these are very accurate locations. And you can see a number of these strikes, and I think those are strength boundaries. Uh, and you can see that it's just before it managed to break forward. There was a long pause here, and then it broke forward. But it's still a strength boundary. There's probably, a, when you look carefully, there's probably some small kinks in the dike there. Uh, and that's true at a number of places. So, yes, it's partly the, the pressure supply as you break your way forward, and partly uh, high strength regions it's trying to get past. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so, the final talk today will be given by Nick Kuznir, who's going to talk about. Uh, uh, ridge jumps and oceanic plateau. Thanks. So, yep. Uh, intro. Oh, look at this. Intro-ocean ridge jumps, oceanic plateaus, and upper mantle <laughs> inheritance. Um, plate tectonics at 50 years. I think it's been. I think we all agree it's been an extremely <coughs> successful unifying theory, um, and it's had fundamental implications not just for surface processes, but also deep mantle processes. I think we now see that uh, um, plate tectonics, how it fits into thermal boundary, or how it is um, part of the whole mantle convection scheme, how it is thermal boundary layer convec uh, convection. I think as well, um, other work is actually um, showing that it has implications for mantle uh, chemical heterogeneity, for instance, the recent paper by Barry et al. The aims of this presentation are to use oceanic crustal thickness mapping to investigate intra-ocean ridge jumps and oceanic plateaus and to explore complexity of seafloor spreading and implications for mantle heterogeneity. So let's see if this advances. It does. The tool for mapping oceanic crustal thickness is going to be gravity inversion, input data, free air gravity, bathymetry, ocean isochrons, if we believe them, uh, sediment thickness, <laughs> and outputs are... Um, 3D volumes of MOHO depth, crustal thickness, continental lithosphere thinning factor. Why or how can we map uh, crustal thickness uh, for the oceans today when perhaps we couldn't do it 10 years ago? Well, I think the key um, advance is, is the ubiquity of excellent satellite uh, gravity anomaly data now. But as well, um, going back, back about 10 years, um, we were able to actually come up with a way of correcting um, for the very large um, lithosphere thermal gravity anomaly correction. Um, oceanic lithosphere is obviously hot, therefore it's less dense. It's got a negative gravity anomaly. At an ocean ridge, that's about th minus 350 milligals. Um, it's the same for ocean basins and ocean margins, but less in magnitude. We need to allow for this. Um, otherwise, we can't uh, solve uh, for MOHO depth um, or crustal basement thickness. Just a, um, a quick word about the technique. It's a uh, uh, 3D spectral inversion uh, technique after Parker. Okay, and we invoke a thing called Smith's theorem, okay, which is, gives us a unique solution for the assumptions we make. Um, we can apply this uh, for the oceans globally, and let's just have a quick uh, uh, tour. Here we see the Indian Ocean, good place to start. Blues are uh, 0 to 8 kilometres thickness. Uh, yellows perhaps going up to about 15. Sorry, greens up to about 15. Yellows up to about 20, and reds, okay, 25 to 30. And what we can see within uh, the Indian Ocean, for instance, is generally blue, okay, that's oceanic crust, typically five, six, seven kilometers thick, occasionally a bit thinner, sometimes a bit thicker. But also what we see as well is quite a lot of oceanic plateaus and microcontinents. And we're going to be looking at some of these. Now let's just go around the world, okay, around the world again. Um, <clears throat> here's the Atlantic. And now let's just focus in, okay, on the South Atlantic. Um, <laughs> Down there, we've got the Rio Grande Rise and, and Walvis Ridge. I'm mainly going to be talking about uh, the Rio Grande Rise there. But both of them, uh, we're predicting, have got maximum thicknesses <coughs> of about 25 kilometers of, of crust. Um, this one here. 
Um, ocean drilling goes back uh, quite a long way, uh, as we saw this morning, okay, in this region. Um, but uh, basalts were recovered or sort of tens of years ago. Uh, the, for the uh, Rio Grande rise, which is this feature here, the ages are late Cretaceous, sort of early tertiary. More recently, though, uh, CPRM, the Brazilian Geological Survey, using submersibles, has recovered um, <clears throat> um, other lithologies, um, sort of uh, continental lithologies, granites, granulites, gneisses, pegmatites, uh, from uh, the main Rio Grande rise here, um, and these have got surprising ages, uh, 500 million years through to 2.2 uh, giga years. Um, <clears throat> if we take those crustal thickness maps from gravity inversion and put them into uh, G plates, G plates version 1.5 using uh, Saturn's 2012 poles and polygons, if we wind the restoration back to 85 million years, this is what we see. Um, we see Wolvis Ridge and uh, um, Rio Grande Rise as a single feature, okay, and we can be tempted um, to draw an analogy with, with Iceland today. If we go back 80, 75, 70, 65, what we're seeing as well is a series of successive or multiple ocean ridge jumps and plate boundary organizations initially uh, seafloor spreading was here, two, three, four. Um, and <clears throat> also, if we start looking at the age of basalt magmatism here, both for Wolvis Ridge and Rio Grande Rise, it's quite a lot of data. We see that the basalt magmatism uh, runs from 114 million years to 27. Um, one comment, okay, it's very, very difficult to uh, explain this pattern, especially when you look at it in detail, um, simply by uh, a mantle plume track. Let's now move to the Indian Ocean. Um, the Indian Ocean shows many oceanic plateaus and, and some microcontinents. Um, it also shows uh, intra-oceanic ridge jumps and plate boundary uh, reorganizations. Um, <clears throat> we see... Uh, well, we see those enfold in a moment. If we uh, take again the uh, global crustal thickness map for the oceans and put it into G plates, um, <clears throat> what we see at 90 million years is something like this. This is just using uh, the default poles from, uh, and polygons from Saturn 2012. Um, we see this configuration here. Uh, in this part of the world, which is where we're going to be looking, start with um, the approximate position, we're not sure exactly where it was, uh, but the approximate position of the ocean ridge is somewhere through here. Now, I'd also like to draw your attention to this region within uh, the red circle. Okay, um, as we'll see, uh, many of those oceanic plateaus evolve by ridge jumps into what becomes this region as, 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 we, as we propagate seafloor spreading. And possibly this must be certainly an anomalous piece of mantle, perhaps an anomalous piece of fertile mantle. So here we are at 85 million years. Okay. Um, <clears throat> at 80 million years, um, we've abandoned seafloor spreading here. Um, it's jumped to the north, or there's been a plate boundary reorganization. Perhaps ridge jump isn't the right word. Um, um, and it's now in the region which lies today between Conrad Rise and Crozet Plateau. Take it to 75, 70, 65, 60, 55. Um, the seafloor spreading is, is now abandoned between Crozet and Conrad, uh, and we start uh, the early propagation up to the Rodriguez triple junction of the southwest Indian ridge. And if we take this through to 50, 45, at uh, 40, okay, that's a, then when we see sort of broken ridge come off Kerguelen, 30. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> sort of clearly then, um, oceanic plateaus such as Conrad, Crozet, Madagascar form, appear to be formed during ridge jumps or associated with ridge jumps, possibly fertile mantle, okay. Why should we uh, re-thicken, okay, or get further magmatism on top of oceanic crust? Um, um, so, we may have fertile mantle, but actually Zau and Dick have, have shown 
okay, that if you look at the lithologies on Swear today, yes, you get normal basalt, uh, normal thickness oceanic crust, but you get domains of exhumed mantle. Okay, so we've got very variable lithologies along the uh, Swear Ocean Ridge. Um, clearly, it seems to imply that the mantle is not just one material, it is highly heterogeneous. Let's now go to the Northeast Indian Ocean. How are we doing that? Um, at 68 million years, we have this configuration. This is a new um, <clears throat> reconstruction with, with our own new poles and polygons. But this is what we think um, the Northeast Indian Ocean looked like at that time. 56 million years, uh, the Carlsberg Ridge is propagated further down. Okay, if you uh, like uh, plume tracks, that's where the reunion hotspot would, tr would, would, would be. From about 55 to 35 million years, we seem to uh, lose a discrete plate boundary. We've just got a complex zone here of um, magmatic addition, building up crustal thickness, and also quite uh, widespread rifting, knocking it down, thinning it down. Five, thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, 40, this diffuse plate boundary continues. 30, okay, it's only at 30 million years that we get Chagos Bank coming out of Nazareth Bank and we go back to what we might call a discrete plate boundary. Um, and um, <clears throat> if we go to the present day, it's worth just noting Chagos here. These black things are earthquake uh, epicenters. Okay, we can see here uh, black uh, dots here. Um, Chagos is actively uh, extending uh, today, and one wonders whether the start of a new ridge jump, which may in fact go into the Chagos banks. Um, <clears throat> now, um, dominantly, we're seeing um, oceanic crust in this region, magmatically thickened, uh, ahead of propagating seafloor spreading. But as well, a few years ago with Trond, we published uh, results which um, report Precambrian age zircons recovered on Mauritius. Um, the last uh, case history is northeast, uh, I, uh, northeast Atlantic and Iceland. Here we see crustal basement thickness from gravity inversion. Um, here we see cross plots against seismic estimates with and without receiver functions. We see a good correlation of the gravity derived crustal thickness against the uh, seismic estimates, particularly for the non receiver function values. Um, <clears throat> Geochemical evidence reported in that paper uh, by the Oslo group okay, um, suggests we have some continental material under southeast Iceland. Here we see the continental crust contamination trend, as, as, it, as it was called in the paper. Um, what we believe we have is 30 kilometer thick crust under southeast Iceland here. Um, ge geochemical evidence for some continental component we believe that it extends offshore under this bank called Skaldersgrun, but note we think it's distinct from the Faroes Iceland Ridge, um, and we think it's the southern continuation of the Jan Mayen microcontinent. So, just to summarize, seafloor spreading is complex. Um, a comment earlier that um, in the, in the um, continents, you know, the continent deformation appears to be much more complicated than oceanic. But perhaps if, as, if we look carefully, okay, we see that oceanic deformation is quite complex too. So we see repeated intra-oceanic plate boundary reorganizations and ridge jumps. Uh, we, see, we see that the jumps are magmatic, generating ocean plateaus. We see evidence for intra-oceanic continental fragments. So questions, are these plate reorganizations locally or globally driven? Some are certainly globally driven, plate re global plate reorganizations. Are these inter-ocean oceanic regions underlain by mantle with some inherited continental component? Possibly. Um, sort of the last point there, can these ocean ridge reorganizations be explained by upper mantle chemical heterogeneity, water or CO2, and mantle thermal fluctuations from plate tectonic thermal boundary layer convection. And, okay, plate tectonics, the next 50 years, what are we still to learn? So I'll just leave you this, which is a blow-up of Chagos coming out of Nazareth Bank. Thank you. Any, any questions for Nick?
Dan McKenzie. I don't understand how you distinguish between the age of the the the, the, the model age of the 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 lead and and strontium and neodymium, right? Which for Motion Islands typically goes back a gig year, right? From is it? How do you know that that's a, a, a continental uh, model age rather than an oceanic one? I think I need to refer you to my ge geochemical collaborators. There, that is. It's a weak answer, but that is, the, okay, the, the, the geochemistry I struggle with. Um, sort of, you've obviously read the PNAS paper, okay, um, uh, have you? I mean, the, the, I, I simply don't understand how you distinguish right, between essentially an absolutely similar date which you get from ocean islands, typically from the mantle, which is... Uh, 500 to a gig a year yep. from essentially a continental signal. If, if, if I can sort of pass that question because I can't answer it, Dan. Um, Rob Butler is trying to tell me something, but I don't know what it is. Look, keep going, keep going. Um, Richard. Yeah, Richard Gordon, I, it's more of a comment than a question. You were talking about the seismicity in Chagos, and you've got north-south extension there, and how it might be related to a new ridge along the central Indian ridge. Um, but, you know, in our work, we've related that to the contract north-south contraction farther to the, to, to the east, and so we consider it an active plate boundary between the Indian plate to the north and the Capricorn plate to, to, to the south. Um, and in fact, you know, from, from the marine geophysical data, we worked out re relative angular velocities of India, Capricorn, and Australia, and it's been confirmed by space geodetic data. We've got India moving towards Australia at 15 we millimeters don't, a year, so. But we don't see the earthquakes, okay, giving that continuity. Okay. Oh, well, well, but of course uh, not. You, the polar rotation is right there in between where you have yep. extension and contraction. Yep. So the displacement rates vanish, and so do the strain rates. So you're not going to get earthquakes right there. I mean, it fits perfectly with what you would expect. Yeah, another comment. If it, it looks, what well, we can see here, we, we think we can see the flow lines. Let's just go to that final diagram. Okay, it, it, we, can see, we can see with the shaded relief gravity, we can see the flow lines, the transforms of how Chagos has come out of Nazareth Bank. Okay, um, but if you try to put... Chagos back, it back in there, it doesn't work. It's, it's, it's extended, okay, in a, roughly a north-south direction by probably about 10%, okay. Um, so I think um, as it's come out, well, at some point, it has been deformed. Um, and I think uh, the, South Am the Southampton group have actually published on what appears to be a sort of rift running through it as well. You may be right, though, but, uh, but I think... Yeah, I mean, you can't fit the data north of it uh, back to Somalia with the same rotation that you can fit the data south of it. I mean, we showed that 30 years ago, so. <laughs> Sorry, you, well, you so, so what do you say? So, so, the, you, so you, sort you of do, you north, don't, north of Chagos, you've, you've got the Indian plate, right? And it re, you can fit that back to Somalia. South of Chagos, it's actually, you know, there's a finite, it's not a, a narrow boundary, it's a wide boundary, but south of Chagos, you can fit that back to S S uh, Somalia. That's the Capricorn plate, but those angular velocities are significantly different. That is India, Somalia to the north, Capricorn, Somalia to the south, uh, in the south. But for what time are we talking about? I'm talking about, um, you know, very recent for this. Yeah, uh, yeah, right if now, you the, about, last, if, the last 15 if, million years. But if you talked about the Somalia plate, uh, okay, but yeah. we'll talk about it later. <laughs> 